I will uh, uh, share, first of all, uh, that in order to be compliant with the GDPR, um, uh, I need to make you aware that um, the, the entire uh, session, the entire event will be recorded and made available. So uh, if you have any problem with that, um, you will uh, need to um, pull yourself out and communicate this to, to us. Um, I also wish to uh, remind speakers while thanking them, and, and especially those who will uh, um, speak today, that um, we aim at publishing a book uh, we uh, collecting uh, texts from uh, those speakers who took part in the event. Whereas mm, we have already enough um, enough uh, uh, participants to the book to confirm that the book will actually be produced. Um, we will only be able to uh, uh, define the structure of the book and the themes of the book once every speaker would have uh, replied to us whether he or she is available and willing or not. So please, we, you will receive an email again, and I'm very grateful for the colleagues and Gian Maria Milan in the first place, Riccardo Pavoni and Alessandro Palmieri, who are um, attending this um, task. Uh, without any further ado, I give the floor to Pasquale Anichino, one of the partners of the project, he will be in charge of this uh, uh, fourth and final session. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much to the organizers, to the different institutions which have uh, brought together this uh, incredible panel today and also the other days. And uh, I'm honored to chair uh, the meeting today, which is uh, the closing session, in, uh, effectively of the of the conference that we have gone through the last uh, two days and a half basically uh, it's a topic which is um, particularly dear to me and uh, of which all of you I think uh, can understand uh, the relevance not only for the technical topics that they are going to deal with but I would say also generally from um, from the point of view I mean uh, I remember reading uh, an article by Professor Zeno Zenkovic uh, a few months ago on the datification of the law, the law that uh, the role that data have in law, and now the role of data, uh, amount of data who are available, and so on, change also the epistemological uh, conception of the role of law in society, which is something which I truly believe in. And in fact, uh, yesterday I was uh, reflecting upon the title of the session. And the title of the session, as you can see, is Data Security and the Protection of Privacy. I think that I discussed also with the organizer, probably, the title of the session. And I thought that uh, what we are going to hear today goes, of course, even beyond the protection of privacy. This is an old debate uh, among the experts of EU law, and also especially among the experts of the GDPR. Uh, in the text of the GDPR, which is quite long, as many of you know, the word privacy appears only in footnotes, does not appear in the text of the law. Uh, because in fact, the GDPR and all the EU framework is not only a framework about privacy, it's a framework about data. And in fact, the, the recent initiative from the Commission, uh, the EU data strategy, the white paper on artificial intelligence, the regulation on non-personal data, creates a framework which deals not only with data protection and therefore privacy, but deals with data as such. Some of you might have seen the opinion of the European Data Protection Supervisor of a couple of days ago on the EU data strategy. Uh, the big debate which is going to go on now on data spaces, for instance, that concerns not only privacy, that concerns industrial data and any kind of data. So also a sector which are traditionally non-human rights sector, like commercial law, as we have heard also yesterday in the, in the panel, will be completely affected by this change of, uh, of scenario. So we have uh, five uh, fantastic speakers today. I've been in touch with all of them, and I thank them for sending to me all the relevant information. I have also, uh, I tend to be quite draconian in time management. So I have warned the speakers that they have 30 minutes, 
uh, I will send the first mo uh, warning when they have 10 minutes left and then when they have two minutes left. So I will stick with that rule and I will send the warning in. So you are warned again. Um, and our first speaker is uh, um, uh, Professor Paolo Cesarini, which is the head of Media Convergence and Social Media Unit at the European Commission DigiConnect. Uh, as again, as some of you might know, the DigiConnect is one of the key players here in the, the different unit, the IoT unit, the media unit, and so on, on this kind of uh, paradigmatic shift uh, in the approach that the European Union uh, is having on the role of data. So we are very uh, uh, pleased and lucky to be able to to hear today from um, Paolo Cesarini, whose title of the presentation is Misinformation and Digitization of uh, Media Ecosystem. Uh, and he will deal with the quite uh, sensitive and relevant topic, also because if you take into account the interaction between the media and data, you have seen that there has been also recent action uh, by the European External Action Service, a recent report published on the role of uh, uh, other countries in, in using media to destabilize uh, European democracies and so on. And Professor um, Paolo Cesarini will discuss some key phenomena like clickbaiting, micro-targeting, algorithm distortion, and all the discussion which many lawyers are having today on so-called uh, algorithmic accountability, algorithm uh, data protection impact assessment, and so on. So I'm sure we will learn a lot from the presentation that Paolo Cesarini will give us today. Therefore, I give him the floor. It's 9.35. Uh, Professor Cesarini, you have 30 minutes. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, very good. Thanks. So good morning uh, to everybody. And uh, I'm very pleased and honored for your invitation. Uh, indeed, your event uh, cut very large around the themes uh, that involves the uh, debate uh, around data, data usage, data exploitation. Uh, and I will touch upon this theme by taking a very specific perspective uh, this morning. Uh, the perspective of the use of data, including personal data, for the purposes of uh, disseminating in a malicious way messages and narratives that have the potential to undermine our democracies by sowing distrust in the uh, institutions, in the media, by creating divisions in society that lead to polarization and therefore to erosion of uh, 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 citizen trust on, uh, your, uh, on democratic uh, systems and processes. Um, you know, the term fake news has become very popular in the, uh, in the year 2016 to a point to have been included as the word of the year by the Oxford Dictionary, in particular because it has been one tool that has been used in the context of the presidential elections uh, uh, in the US in 2016. Uh, there are several examples, I will only remain, uh, recall the, the most uh, a renowned one, the Pizzagate, which considerably undermined the chances for Hillary Clinton to run for the presidential, and also the uh, alleged endorsement by the Pope uh, by, uh, of the Trump's candi um, uh, candidature. And that was, of course, uh, uh, a, a, a propaganda, it was a deliberate campaign that was based on nothing not on facts, but on pure inventions and fabricated uh, stories. Uh, Brexit. Brexit has been, as you know, a cataclysmic uh, event for Europe and has been largely driven by a number of narratives that have been orchestrated around stories without any uh, factual foundation. Uh, but later on, we, we noticed that uh, this information has become increasingly a tool uh, for uh, influencing public opinion in a manner that harnesses the opacity of the, the media uh, uh, ecosystem due to the profound transformations that this ecosystem has undergone uh, during the digitalization phase, uh, moving from the traditional broadcasting and print media to digital media. 
uh, the presidential elections in France in 2017 has been punctuated by this uh, phenomenon, particularly in the last days of the campaign with the famous Macron leaks uh, uh, scandal, which was a case where uh, the cyber, a cyber attack and disinformation actions were uh, combined together in order to discredit uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the candidate in the very last moment of the campaign. Uh, another example, now moving more on the in, uh, an influence exercised by third countries and by the what we call inf uh, information operations or foreign influence operations. You may recall in 2018 the case of uh, the Salisbury attack uh, against uh, an ex-agent uh, of the Russian intelligence, which was, uh, uh, which is, I life, Sergio Scripton. And around that story, a very complex campaign made of uh, uh, interactions in Facebook, Twitter, but also with the involvement of traditional media, took place to the extent that provoked a serious, very serious dip diplomatic crisis with a large number of diplomatic representation being withdrawn from Russia and vice versa. So uh, all this is linked, as I said, uh, very much in, uh, to the uh, changing landscape of the uh, uh, media sector. Uh, today, uh, around 62% of Europeans get their news through internet and mainly from social media. The diet, the information diet of each European has increased in terms of sources before the, uh, before the uh, uh, emergence of social media, the number, the average number, according to a study carried out by the Oxford the Internet Institute, the average number of sources consulted by, uh, on average by citizens in Europe was 1.7 sources daily. News, uh, we have now 3.5 as an average figure that describes the number of sources that people access every day in order to uh, get news, information about general affairs. So in that sense, internet has expanded the, uh, the possibilities for people to get informed. At the same time, there are very worrying uh, signals as well, because uh, the same study demonstrates that the capacity of people to understand uh, uh, the context in which this uh, uh, news, this information are conveyed to them has sensibly uh, uh, decreased. In particular, as regard the identification of the sources and the memorization of the sources. People do not remember where the information comes from and therefore they do not have the same relationship with the authoritativeness of the sources that they were used to have in the traditional news media setup. They simply do not pay attention to the sources. And in that context, of course, uh, you uh, have a, a context in which the prolifer proliferation of fake news, disinformation campaigns, uh, finds a fertile ground because the uh, opacity and the uh, lack of intelligibility regarding the trustworthiness of the sources uh, may help to permeate the, the public opinion with narratives irrespective of their own credibility, veracity, and authenticity. Um, the Commission has intercepted this phenomenon already a couple of years ago. We, uh, we published a communication in March, no, in April 2018, uh, setting out for the first time a strategy to combat this phenomenon. And the, the most relevant part, in my view, of this communication today, it is the definition of, uh, of this information. The, uh, this information is defined in that communication as verifiably false or misleading information which is created, presented and disseminated for economic gain or to intentionally deceive the public and cause harm, a public harm. Now, uh, these three elements of the definition are important. So, first of all, you have verifiably false or misleading information. This is about content. This is about an, a, a textual analysis of the message. Uh, therefore, uh, it calls into question whether or not we have enough in our ecosystem 
enough capabilities to have a scrutiny of the veracity of the content and uh, the ability to communicate the existence of distortions in the textual distort distortions, I mean, the, the, the different natures. Huh? They, they can be outright false, fabricated news, that is clear, but there are other uh, 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 situations where the identification, it is much more difficult, it could be decontextualized uh, information, it could be uh, de uh, deconstructed information or partial information that it is equally misleading. Then you have the uh, a second element, which is the, in, uh, the intention to deceive. That what it distinguish this information from another terms, which is often used, even at the title of my intervention, which is misinformation. Misinformation, it is still verifiably false or uh, misleading uh, information, but uh, without the authors having the intention to deceive the audiences, the target. And the third element, and the third element, it is the potential to cause harm. And the potential to cause harm, it has been quite obviously demonstrated in several occasions. The, the potential to uh, uh, interfere or to affect the integrity of elections. Well, the example of the presidential campaign in 2016 in the US, it is an example. The Brexit referendum is another example. But the potential to cause harm has to be seen also in a broader way as a potential to affect public goods. What are the public goods? Well, uh, today we would say health. It is a main public good. Good. The uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic has been accompanied by a flurry of uh, disinformation campaigns. Uh, citizens have been particularly confused around many issues around the origin of the virus. It is artificial. It is natural origin, for instance. Around the effectiveness of the remedies. Does drinking bleach really cures the virus? That, uh, does putting vinegar in a nostril really prevents you from getting the virus. All these type of uh, oxys and uh, uh, really uh, dangerous oxys, I would say, have been uh, widely spread during the last three, four months during the pandemic. Um, but there are also other uh, uh, aspects. You know, uh, sometimes this information can switch from the off online world to uh, the offline world. Take the example of the 5G story that has, by the way, endorsed by, by uh, reputable uh, scientists like uh, Luc Montagnier, ex-Nobel uh, uh, Prize, uh, that has uh, supported the myth uh, uh, that suggested that the spread of the virus, it, was some, it is some, uh, somehow connected with the deployment of 5G infrastructures, so with the microwaves. Um, the, the, the fact that uh, this, uh, this idea has been then taken up and circulated on various platforms, from YouTube to Facebook, and from Facebook to TikTok. And when it gets into close group like uh, 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 TikTok, you may have close communities that intercept the message and translate it into action. And you have seen in Europe, and not only in Europe, actions to, uh, becoming harsh attacks against the network infrastructures, particularly in the UK, in the Netherlands, in Spain, and there has been even an attempt in Italy to do the same. So it becomes a, 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 an element that uh, push uh, towards violent actions in the real physical world. So it is a serious, very serious uh, uh, phenomenon. Of course, you need always to keep in mind that, you know, uh, we are uh, walking on very thin ice because uh, when you talk about news, you need to distinguish from views. It is extremely dangerous uh, to have a wide definition of disinformation that could impinge upon freedom of expression and, of course, uh, other freedoms like freedom of press and pluralism. And that is uh, and remains at the core of uh, all the uh, discussions and actions taken in this respect during the last couple of years. But let me go back to the most intriguing element uh, of, the, of this definition, which is the intentionality. Of course, it's difficult to, difficult to crystal ball the intentions of people that hide behind the net in order to operate uh, covertly, 
and carrying out operations which have a harmful uh, 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 objective. The intentionality, however, can be deducted or, in, or, uh, or uh, intercepted through a contextual analysis let look at it actors involved, the, the vectors uh, used, the dissemination methods that have been implemented, as well as the targeted of the campaigns themselves. And all, when you look at these the dynamics, you see that systematically, uh, this information, it is a strategy that harness five main vulnerabilities, which are present in the current phase of the digital transformation of the media ecosystem. These five vulnerabilities are linked to data. Again, the data is the fuel for uh, uh, propagating uh, this information and the use of data it is, um, uh, takes place in a context which is highly opaque, highly uh, uh, difficult to uh, uh, perceive by ordinary audience. The first example, the first type of uh, vulnerability it is micro-targeting and personalization of uh, political advertising. What it means? Well, everybody has uh, read about uh, the Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal, and everybody has uh, got a very clear example on how data can be used in order to segment the population and to serve different segments of the population with different type of messages that are functional, however, to one specific goal, dividing sowing distrust, dividing people by serving them with different stories that comply with their own inner beliefs. So harnessing the confirmation bias and transforming the, let's say, the online communities into tribes that tends to oppose to each other. Um, Micro-targeting use data, of course, use data, use prof uh, profiling data and, uh, and identify uh, and groups uh, people according to preferences and, and identify the preferences based on techniques that are probably in certain cases contrary to the GDPR. It's true. In the Cambridge Analytica case, there was a case of violation of GDPR. It was a data breach. That's clear but not necessarily you have data breaches. If you look at commercial communications, commercial advertising, well, all, everything you receive in your smartphones, in your computer, that the result of personalization of advertising that you, your own data with your consent, and the consent is given by all of us in a manner which is automatic, which is not uh, really uh, useful in terms of filtering out uh, uh, um, messages that we receive that would be undesirable for us. So basically, the, uh, the uh, online advertising, it is prospering based on the uh, profilage, uh, profiling of, of users and the identification of relevant content on, basis, on the basis of this profiling. When you apply that to the political context, of course, you enter in a different field, which can lead to uh, uh, very serious uh, uh, situations. The second example of uh, uh, um, uh, vulnerability is the astroturfing. What does it mean, astroturfing? Astroturfing means to simulate, the, uh, to simulate uh, through a number of techniques, malicious techniques, uh, uh, the uh, activity of a crowd within a social network. So if you use bots, if you use fake accounts, if you use uh, uh, cyber mercenaries or trolls that creates a buzz around a, uh, a, a narrative, you can convey the idea that that narrative have a large popular support. And since we have all based on this uh, another cognitive bias, which is the group belonging bias, uh, we tend to accredit credibility and, tr and trustfulness uh, to messages and narratives that seems to be supported by a large crowd. And that is where the, one of the manners in which online is much more easy to, com to disseminate this information than in the offline world. The third uh, vulnerability is linked to the algorithms that are run by the major online platforms. Can be ranking algorithms, can be recommender systems, can be search for Google, or can be the recommendation that you receive in YouTube, 
or could be the uh, ranking that you have on your timeline in Twitter or on Facebook uh, newsfeed. Well, the, uh, the question all the, uh, here it is that uh, traditionally, in a very opaque uh, fashion, of course, uh, without much accountability around, uh, the uh, algorithms tend to privilege uh, signals that are indicators of the popularity of the content. And they do not rely on other indicators which are linked to the credibility of the sources, of the trustworthiness of the sources. And, uh, um, and then, to give an example, in YouTube, you have a monthly engagement, a monthly view of around 2 billion viewers uh, around the world, 2 billion. Uh, out of these two billions, 30% uh, uh, result from direct search, 30% of this engagement result from direct search, 70% result from, the, uh, from uh, in, um, in, um, interactions driven by the uh, recommender system of YouTube. So the algorithms play an enormous role in the, in the diffusion of the information on this type uh, of platforms. Um, the question is how accountable they are. The, the, fourth, uh, uh, the fourth element, it is clickbaiting. It is at the basis of the, of the um, current uh, um, uh, online displayed advertising systems. Uh, in essence, you have uh, real bid, real time bid markets that place advertising on certain websites and they do it and do that in the matter of milliseconds. And the, and, and the way that these placements are made Look at the gain, what? Popularity, attraction, attention of the website. Now, we know that websites that publish sensationalistic news, uh, sometimes disinformation, are very much are a magnet for public attention. And it's there where advertisers want to be placed because they know that they can capture, capture quite large audiences. That is another problem. 10 and minutes. Finally, and, the finally, and the final element, yes, 10 minutes, right? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Um, so the final element, it is about the diffusion dynamics. Uh, the diffusion dynamics can be hybrid uh, and are hybrid very much. And this is where foreign influence operations come uh, very much prominently. Uh, you have the dark web that creates uh, 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 the first uh, embryo of a narrative. Then you have uh, cross communities like in 4chan or Infowars website that basically boost uh, a certain story that it is then transformed into a social media uh, buzz. And, and then is the problem. The problem that when the, uh, the, the buzz becomes a social media uh, uh, issue or a story that becomes popular on social media, the media, the traditional media tend to, uh, uh, to pick it up and to give even more resonance, even more oxygen to stories that uh, without prior verification, verifications, then proved to be false and misleading. So what we can do about it? In the last 10 minutes, I would like to tell you a little bit what we can do about it. Well, uh, you know, uh, first of all, you need to understand, uh, we have to understand that uh, this information is not necessarily illegal. So the traditional framework, legal framework, which is basically the e-commerce directive that provides for a limited liabilities for platforms and the oblige platforms to remove expeditiously uh, illegal content once they have notification of the presence of this content on their services, well, that doesn't apply necessarily to a content which is not illegal. Furthermore, since the, this information is very often illegal, it's not always be, uh, easy to distinguish from opinions, you have a need really to, uh, to keep in mind the basic principles, which is Article 11 of the Charter, of fundamental rights, which you know, in, uh, provides that everybody has the right to freely express uh, in itself, so to impart and receive information without interference from, from governments and uh, irrespective of borders, to receive and to impart information. But the point is that you have all citizens have also the right to receive information. When you say information, you don't say disinformation. So in order to have an informed public opinion under the concept that it is built in Article 11 of the Charter, uh, there is a need to, uh, to, to build a, 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 an interpretation that uh, consider information as reliable information. So citizens have the right to uh, identify what in the space 
it is reliable from what is not reliable. And that it is a basic uh, safeguard uh, 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 compliance with the uh, um, freedom of expression. At the same time, of course, all system of uh, mass surveillance or censorship had to be avoided because that would be clearly against the, the principles. How we have gone about? We have gone about uh, in, a, in a soft way, using soft law, using self-regulation. And the code of practice of this information, which was uh, adopted uh, in uh, October 2018, is the first worldwide example of a self-regulation that is designed to uh, capture and address uh, uh, this phenomenon. If you look at the code, basically you have five chapters, and each of these chapters try to respond to the five vulnerabilities that I just mentioned. The first, uh, uh, it is the scrutiny of ad placement to remove clickbaiting incentives. The second one, it is uh, transparency for political and issue-based advertising, which should put more uh, awareness and more accountability around the use of micro-targeting uh, uh, techniques. The third is about uh, obligations that uh, uh, the uh, main online platforms have taken up in order to ensure the integrity of their own services and to avoid astrotarpy techniques from being implemented. The fourth, uh, the fourth pillar of the code is about empowering and raising awareness of consumers, which basically means shifting the, uh, the, the structure of the algorithms from popularity to authenticity, and uh, including the use of trustworthiness indicators that have to be built. They are still not yet there, but need to be the result of a uh, multi-stakeholder engagement that includes media uh, outlets and media organizations as uh, providers of these uh, 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 indicators. And finally, in order to avoid the hybrid diffusion dynamics, the only real answer there in the code it is expanding the level of cooperation between online platforms and uh, the research community. The research community to debunk, to unmask covert operations that exploit the different level of opacity in the net in order to disseminate more widely and to create artificial credibility around certain narratives. Now, what has happened? Are we there? Are we, uh, have we done something? Yes, we have done something good, I think. The, uh, during, the con uh, in the, um, during the COVID the pandemic, uh, the, uh, the major platforms, and when I say major platforms, I refer to Facebook, Twitter, Google, Microsoft, and, uh, and uh, YouTube, of course. Uh, WhatsApp and TikTok that are profiling themselves as uh, uh, as uh, voluntary participants to this endeavor. There have been a number of important actions that have been taken. More prominence has been given to authoritative sources. In that sense, the algorithms have been really tweaked substantially in the manner they rank uh, the contents. Uh, this information uh, content verified by fact checkers as false or misleading has been demoted in the ranking. And when there are issues about public health or public order, the content has been removed. Uh, it is taking place in a very uh, transparent, understandable way. No, it is not the case. So we need to step forward to go beyond. So the self-regulatory uh, uh, structure it is essential in order to take into account so the specificity of the services, the specific challenges that each different service uh, represents, pose, at the same time giving the possibility to remove this uh, risk of direct interference by public authorities in the information space, but at the same time the system of control, oversight and sanctions is not there. So we need probably to think about a co-regulatory framework where accountability will be strongly enhanced. How to do it? Well, you have two options, public or civil society driven uh, type of oversight. In this moment, the debate is open, but certainly the, the, the system to create a superstructure, which is basically a kind of uh, more cogent system of rules that look at the principles and ensure that the self-regulatory principles that uh, the platforms have given for themselves are effectively uh, applied and the impact on the, on the in practice, it is tangible and positive. Well, this type of oversight probably should be delegated to the uh, uh, civil society, to the media and to the 
most importantly, the research community itself. In other terms, it's time to create a new community that is composed of media, fact checkers, researchers, and when I say researchers, I mean communication experts, I mean data specialists. Two minutes. Yes, I mean uh, uh, network experts, I mean also sociologists, economists, of course, by a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary, um, multidisciplinary community with uh, uh, a good knowledge of local, uh, local uh, uh, information environments uh, that is able to carry out uh, this type of analysis without uh, uh, control by uh, uh, the big brother, by the state, by the government. Uh, there is the 1st of June this year, so a few days ago, uh, the first embryo of this a network of communities, of multidisciplinary communities, has been launched. Uh, it is called the European Digital Media Observatory. It, has, it is hosted and coordinated by the European uh, University Institute in Florence. I'm very happy for that, because it's close to Siena. <laughs> and, uh, and, that, uh, and the task of the ETHMO, of the European Digital Media Observatory, starts now. And its main task will be exactly to build up this, uh, 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 this community of researchers and fact checkers and help to create a real resilience in the society by the civil society uh, uh, and to enhance their, for the ability of citizens to have a much better, much clearer view of the, uh, of the manner in which the information travels and affect, uh, travels in the online space and affects public opinion. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank, Thank you very much. First of all, being in time and sorry for being a dead draconian, but unfortunately, it's normal. It's normal. Thank you to you, actually. Uh, I wanted to quickly ask you just a quick reaction so that we uh, engage a little bit before the general discussion, in a sense, on two points. Uh, the first that came to my mind, if you have a short comment on it, is uh, how do you see? I mean, the Commission has published a, a new uh, work program. For, and from now until the end of 2020. And if you look at what is going on to happen in digital, there are several legislative initiatives there. Now, do you think that this forthcoming initiative will have an impact on the kind of things you have uh, described? Uh, the Data Act, the Digital Service Act, and all the kind of incoming legislation, because I mean, I think that that might have an impact there mm -hmm. from a legal point of view. Sure. And then uh, uh, the second consideration is more kind of, if we want, uh, kind of sociological, in a sense. Uh, there are debates about uh, regulating uh, fake news, misinformation now in many countries. We have seen what has happened, for instance, uh, with the recent executive order by President Trump on this. Mm -hmm. There is much debate in the US as well. Mm -hmm. uh, is it, it is not the case that uh, much of this debate is also driven by the lack of perception of uh, the, the authority of mainstream media. I mean, in the sense that uh, often uh, this information does need, need to come from uh, people or bloggers or kind of media which are necessarily not in the mainstream. We often see in a kind of, uh, I mean, Antonio Gramsci would have said that this is a subversion of the elites. That a lot of time we see misinformation coming from uh, mainstream media as well. Misinformation not done on purpose, but just for the lack of fact checking or the kind of things that you were describing before. So, uh, besides effort at regulating, uh, we should also try to stimulate efforts at having, you know, uh, better quality. Uh, of media also coming from uh, from mainstream media. Yeah, thank you. There are two very important questions, both of them. Uh, uh, on the first question, yes, you're right. In the work program 2020 of the Commission, there are uh, two, no one, two uh, relevant uh, elements. One is the uh, Digital Services Act, and the other one I would, not, uh, I would uh, indicate as the second important element the European Democracy Action Plan, the EDAP. Those are the two. Uh, on the, uh, the Digital Services Act, uh, one has to understand that, indeed, it will review to a, a large, I think, extent, the, uh, the regime of, li uh, of liability for platforms, but without altering the basis. 
So it will create for sure new, uh, uh, new clear responsibilities for platforms. It will strengthen the oversight mechanisms and will institute specific sanctions which are proportionate to the type of harm that is uh, involved. So in essence, uh, uh, probably the DSA will move from, uh, from the concept of the illegal conduct or content to a broader, uh, uh, to a broader scope uh, that includes also harmful content or conducts, and that may also involve disinformation, right? We have seen with the uh, audiovisual um, media service directive direct, uh, already a move towards a, a, more, uh, a more granular approach for certain types of uh, harmful content, like uh, uh, um, content that affects minors, which is not necessarily legal, but affect minors, with certain, uh, with certain objectives that are fixed in, uh, uh, for the member states to achieve and appropriate measures to be taken by platforms to avoid those type of harms. So that, it is certainly something that will be under consideration, but, uh, you know, the Digital Service Act is a big ship. It will take time before it will cross the whole uh, ocean. And we need responses which are now, which are quick. So uh, the EDAP, the European uh, Democracy Action Plan, will certainly provide for intermediate layer of uh, regulatory intervention out uh, imagine i speak on a personal uh, capacity today saturday i'm not working so <laughs> uh, i'm speaking very much uh, i express my own opinions let's say in this in this case but i think the uh, edap should uh, uh, provide for a more granular and, and faster um, uh, regulatory layer that could also be a recommendation something uh, not necessarily hard law could also be soft law but gives more uh, more um, uh, more teeth to the code of practice or frame better to the code of practice to address certain inconsistencies which is lack of uniformity of definitions which is lack of consistency in terms of processes and procedures put in place by the platforms which is a lack of clear framework for access to data by researchers for research purposes around the phenomenon of the, uh, around threats and trends of disinformation for that you need probably a specific instrument uh, that is about uh, your first question. Your second question, <laughs> that is a real uh, issue. I mean, uh, you know, the executive order shows all the hypocrisy that is behind uh, uh, the use of the concept of freedom of expression. And you can pull it from one side or from the other side, according to what your political agenda is. Uh, uh, Commissioner Juro, Vice President Jurova has clearly expressed her support to the move taken by, courageously, I would say, by uh, Twitter to fact check political statements, including if they come from the President of the United States, and to uh, give citizens, American citizens, the possibility to see whether the statements have been contested by independent uh, uh, in, uh, journalists, uh, and simply to give them the possibility to look what it is uh, the uh, position that the users prefer, uh, prefer to adopt, but having full knowledge or at least a better knowledge of the facts around political statements. Facebook, that was completely against until yesterday, literally until yesterday, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to fact check political statements, uh, quite uh, um, astonishingly has changed its position. If you read yesterday in the press, uh, Mark Zuckerberg has uh, indicated that from now on they will also fact check political statements. Now, the executive order has to be seen in the light of a worrying tendency to use uh, critical situations. You have seen it in Hungary, for instance, uh, where, uh, where this information it is proliferating because of people's anxieties, because of people's incertitudes. Uh, uh, the example, the clear example. It is the, 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 the presidential decree that uh, Orban has uh, uh, pushed through uh, in order to give uh, special powers to repress uh, uh, fake news in the context of the COVID crisis. You know, the risk is that uh, uh, the defense of correct, trustful information is mistaken as an alibi, an, an alibi to silence uh, dissenting voices. And that is really what we need to look at. Yeah. Very, so, rule of law, the principles of the rule of law. 
And what about uh, what you say about the traditional media? I cannot only I can only I mean uh, say that I fully agree with you. The long term response it is a response where the traditional media will have found out ways to uh, to uh, you know build a business model which remains sustainable and not so much dependent on advertising revenues, which we know nowadays are flow uh, are flowing more and more towards the intermediary platforms and away from the uh, uh, from the media outlets themselves. So there is a need for public authority to find ways to support the media, especially in the cri in the crisis situations. You will see later on this year a plan for a plan for recovery of the media ecosystem that Commissioner Breton has announced, and, uh, and with the substantial resources uh, to support. Uh, the, the sector and help to overcome the crisis, but I think we also need to think in more longer ter in longer term. And as far as I'm concerned, the new work program for under Horizon uh, uh, Europe uh, uh, will also provide a substantial funding, hopefully, if the MFF uh, the, uh, discussion will succeed, in order to facilitate the transition of the media, uh, traditional media, towards digital, and to ensure that for that. Uh, um, Activities like investigative journalism and data-driven journalism can be find, can you know um, can flourish in the future because that is the future of journalism. Thank you, thank you very much. I think that uh, we will might have uh, questions later after the second speaker gives her presentation. So I'm happy to give the floor to Professor Luz Martinez Valenzoso, which is chair professor of civil law at the University of Valencia. And she will deal with a um, quite important topic from a legal point of view. The title of her presentation is Consent, Lawful Processing versus Data in Payment for a Service, which is exactly the, in the, the kind of implementation of consent, which is a key cornerstone of the data protection legislation in a particular sector, which is the, the sector of payment for service. So, uh, Professor Velencoso, you have the floor. Usual rules apply. I will send the warnings when they are due. So, you have the floor. Is Professor Verencoso with us? Yes. Maybe he's on mute. No. He's on, yeah. Sorry? Now, yes, now we hear you. You have the floor. Now, now you can listen to me. Sorry. So I, I, I was saying that the, I, it's a, a great pleasure for me to share this, uh, this, this, this morning with all of you. I would like, I would like to, to say thank you to the organizing, to the organizers of the, this very nice conference and also especially to Professor Palmieri who invited me to participate some months before when we were in, in, in Poland in an international conference. So um, I would like, I would, I would be uh, my idea or, or I was very going on, on seeing you in, in, Vienna, in Siena, sorry, but it was not possible so maybe next time. Uh, so I have a presentation I will try to, to show you, uh, maybe a good Samaritan can, can help me if I, I don't get it. So one moment. I think that you will probably have also send the presentation to uh, your... Yeah, I, ha I have it here, I have it here. Okay, I get it. Ca can you see that? Yeah, it's charging, so now we should be able to see. You see that? Now? Yes, we see. Okay, thank you very much. So my topic, this is as uh, as you were saying before, is about the consent. So this uh, this kind of uh, I am a, a private law professor, so it, uh, I am focusing on private autonomy. So you know the personal sphere of the person and so on. And uh, you know uh, you know this uh, this kind of uh, we are this said today that we are in the golden age of the personal data because the, the personal data because. Because not not only in the in the sense of its exploitation, but also in the sense of its regulation. So nowadays, in this case, in this situation of uh, 
big, big data and uh, algorithmic making decisions poses serious risks, risk to, to the protection of intimacy and data and data protection rights because you know there are some some person interested in collecting it is not in equals so this kind of collecting our data to make this kind of big data algorithmic decision and so on there are some people interested in getting our personal data in order to transform them to some profiles and so on and uh, and so they are getting a lot of money because of that you know they are the so-called data brokers they collect data they sell them they transfer them so it is uh, the, the point of view is if it is possible for particulars to dispose to, to the onerously dispose of uh, of the data if the data can see can be seen as a commodity or not so i am going to focus on the the, the double perspective about constitutional the constitutional protection of the right that it should be as a fundamental right in the regulation uh, of the data protection from on an european basis and secondly also from europe come in some kind of regulations protecting consumers see it may be possible for consumers to to dispose to make business with the personal data in order to receive some kind of uh, digital services so from the first perspective so we have the the european regulation it has been a strength the the concept of con the the concept of the consent so the consent uh, it is necessary for the lawful treatment of our personal data it is one of of, on, of the basis for it is allowed to uh, treat the, the, the data and you know it is uh, uh, considered that it should be free it should be informed it should be specific and ambiguous affirmative no way the possible consenting by silence anymore so it has been it has to be given for every activities concerning the treatment with the same purposes in case there are several purposes consent must be given to all of them so uh, also makes responsible the 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 the, 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 the data pro, 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 processor is responsible of uh, complying with the requirements and also there is a general right to withdraw consent at any time for particulars so and also con the consent should be informed so we have to know we have to receive information about the nat the nature of the data processed the purposes of the processing who are going to be the recipients uh, who are our rights in order to uh, you know to uh, to revoke and our consent and so on and also the consequences of non-consenting um, uh, it is not possible as the, con the consent should be uh, and ambiguous, uh, it is not possible this kind of formula that by using our service, your consent to the processing of personal data is understood to be given. And also we have this uh, European judgment, the European Court of Judges judgment of uh, the 1st of October of 2019, where referring to cookies, we have been saying in the, in the last uh, months that it has been changed, so that it is understood that this way of a pre-check check box with that uh, users, user, sorry, must deselect to refuse his or her consent are not anymore allowed. It is necessary up an active conduct for, uh, for, for, for the consumer in order to the cookies, to the treatment of uh, cookies to be allowed. It is also the, the question about the consent when it is a part of a contract. That is, I'm going to refer in the second part of the exposition. Because uh, it is possible that one or of the other uh, lawful uh, basis on the treatment of personal data is that the data is, are necessary for the fulfillment of a contract. In this case, it could not be even necessary. Uh, our consent. So imagine that we are inside a laboral contract and the, our employer uh, takes our personal data, where we live, where we, we are, our bank account and so on. It is not necessary to uh, provide an additional consent to that because the treatment of this kind of data are necessary for the fulfillment of the contract. But imagine another situation in which, for instance, we would like to download from the internet some kind of APP, for instance, a lantern, and we would like to get it. 
And, and they are asking, in order to receive this digital service, they are asking for our personal data. They are asking maybe who we are, our email, uh, our position. So uh, it, they are not the data necessary for the for the for the fulfillment of the contract, but they are. We are providing all, uh, our data as a price for the digital service. So it it puts uh, this situation in connection with the second part that this is about the protection the protection of consumers. So the authorities the authorities they have seen or the European authorities they have seen of course that personal data has a value a very important one. And there is a big opportunity of doing businesses with that. And or they, they, they have considered that it is unfair for particulars, for consumers that have provided data for, uh, for paying for a digital service, not to have the remedies, the contractual remedies necessary in, uh, in case the digital services is not functioning well, is not conform to the contract. So uh, the, the very first one that, uh, that uh, considered the situation was the directive of the, as, um, for the supply of digital content and digital services. And later on, the directive of November 2019, also that in, in the field of modernizing European Union consumer uh, have also provided some kind of remedies in case the, the, the consumer is paying with data for some kind of product or service. So uh, at the, when it was only drafted, uh, the previous version of the Directive of Digital Services, the European Data Protection uh, Supervisor uh, said that it was not very correct to talk about data as a commodity because, you know, that data is a fundamental right. We cannot do businesses with, foment with fundamental rights. So it, this, made, uh, this, this made to change, to change the, 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 only, the, they change only the name, the, the concept commodity appears anymore, but the, remed, the, the remedies are still the same, we are going to see later. So the question is, my idea, I would like to, to transmit to all of you, it is about it is possible in the in the field of data protection we can we can talk about this kind of dichotomy be in between the right of publicity and the right of privacy so you know the right of privacy is a fundamental right we cannot dispose of that but the right of publicity we can do businesses about that so it could be possible maybe for particulars to do businesses with our personal data, with some requirements or respecting the European regulation for data protection. Maybe we are aware of what we are doing. We agree with that. We agree that somebody enters into our personal sphere to take to our data, to do businesses with that. But we are aware of that and we are happy with that because we are receiving a, digi a digital service that is valuable for us. So it, this, it means to be, it seems to be the idea of the, although not employing the concept commodity, it seems to be the idea of the, of the directives we, are, we have been mentioning because the first one, digital content and digital services, it says that uh, it cannot be considered a commodity according to the European uh, authorities, but we are going to provide to that contractual, contractual remedies. So they, this directive should apply to any contract where the consumer provides or undertakes to provide personal data to the trader. So, and the, and the remedies that are confer, that, that are con, 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 uh, that, that are for the consumers is the same. When it is the price reduction, we cannot reduce the price because it was no price. But uh, or even in case of uh, the digital, when the digital service is wrong, the consumer has the possibility to stop, to terminate the contract, even in cases of minor, of minor disconformities with the contract. And secondly, about determination. So we know that from the perspective 
of the of the personal data protection we have at any time the possibility to revoke our consent to the data treatment what if we provided this consent in the field in the realm of a contract because you know the, for, according to the traditional dogmatic of the contract there is no revocable consent we provide our consent and then we have a contract we cannot regret from providing our consent for a contract but for the personal data is different and if we have to terminate the contract because the service was not conforming to the contract the directive says that the uh, digital provider has no the, opp the opportunity to use this data in the future what is your a uh, very you know i think it is very unrealistic because uh, when you transfer your data to this person this person has transferred the data to somebody else and so forth. So it is not very real, not very realistic that you can get your money back. So some well, some of our scholars they talk about the Hotel California effect. You can enter where wherever you would like, but it is very difficult to go outside. Um, and also uh, this this also this other later directive of uh, for the modernization of union cons union consumer protection rules also in the recital uh, 33 mentions that they, these directives should also uh, be extended in the ambit of application to cover also contracts under which the trader supplies a digital service and the consumer provides or under, undertakes to provide personal data. So it is, uh, it is considered normal, so to say. So, uh, from my point of view, what to what to say about that? So, it it, it would be it would be um, no problem if we, it is very clear what we are doing. No? If they are informing us that uh, they are going to they are going to treat our data, maybe to transfer our data to somebody else. But you know, this kind of they don't talk exactly about consent when uh, they, they they talk about priv privacy policies. So many consumers they have. They have considered that they are reading uh, every every time every word of the of the policy terms. It is a uh, you know an Herculean task. Nobody is doing that. And also some of these kind of companies they are actuating in the market in a monopoly. So in that they are they are uh, they, 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 you take it or you leave it. Uh, so if you are very interested in being in Facebook, for instance. You, you are going to say everything every time yes 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 i would like i would like i accept and, uh, and so um also uh, another another solution maybe would be the protection through the unfair terms directive that is especially mentioned in the european regulation for data protection so that many in many situations the, this kind of contract you enter into with a digital service provider it is in the form of a standardized uh, it's an standardized contract with general clauses so uh, they, they are not nego negotiated clauses so if they are drafted so that they are considered unfair this uh, this clauses should be taken out of the contract because considered null and void so the, this has been the solution uh, in germany for instance uh, they have considered several of the clauses that uh, particulars have with Facebook should be considered uh, in the in the uh, void and null because of or in the realm of the uh, uh, unfair terms directive. So it is what I would like to to talk about. So maybe we have some time for for discussion. Thank you very very much for your for for uh, for your passion thank with me. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you very much also for. Uh, giving us some a little bit of more time in case we want to engage uh, in further discussion i have to say that uh, your presentation is a a good example of showing how much uh, uh, data today from the point of view of civil law and commercial law can also be seen as goods uh, and therefore the focus as i tried to convey my introductory remarks should not be only on uh, privacy and data protection but should be on data as such in the different fields, of course, of, uh, of law, whether commercial, civil, uh, criminal, or public, because the, the real paradigmatic shift uh, is there. So we are supposed to have a break now, but I want to open the floor 
for Q and A, if they have, uh, uh, if there are people from the floor who have questions for both speakers, and then we can do our break, which is supposed to be until eleven, and then we resume with the last three presentations. So, if there are questions, uh, unmute yourself and ask the question, uh, and then the speakers will reply to your question. Or you can use the chat as you wish. If uh, we have no question and uh, if the organizer, mm. uh, yes, like maybe uh, I, I can maybe uh, Marco Ventura. Um, a quick question uh, to Paolo Cesarini. Uh, uh, are outsiders from uh, the world you've been describing, so people like myself would be somehow uh, not an insider to this conversation, would, uh, would uh, still see the paradigm of, of eight speech and eight crimes as being very dominant. And the picture you give us seems to suggest that, that, that what you present is something that, 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 that is uh, somehow superseding the aid speech and aid crime infrastructure. Is that, is that true? Uh, is this just a you know, superficial impression? Or because your, your framework seems to be much more comprehensive, deeper, and also able to uh, shed light on the previous one uh, in, in terms of understanding uh, what's happening at that level and also in terms of countering the, the phenomenon. What, what, what do you think about that? Thank you, uh, Marco, uh, for your question. You know, um, a couple of days ago, I was uh, in a, a workshop uh, organized by the uh, World uh, uh, Jewish Council, and the same question uh, came up. Uh, in the sense uh, to ask what is the division between uh, this information that uh, uh, disseminates uh, uh, prejudice and uh, creates uh, uh, fertile grounds for hate against ethnic groups or religious minorities uh, as opposed to the framework which is in place against the hate speech or incitement to violence or terrorism. Well, I think we need to see the uh, uh, communication as a continuum. Uh, uh, the framework uh, that is expressly uh, 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 capturing in its scope uh, uh, hate speech and uh, incitement to violence, in reality captured the tip of the iceberg, not what is lying underneath. When you have uh, the, all the elements uh, that enable, uh, for instance, a judge to consider an expression as uh, against the law because of uh, constitutes a hate crime, uh, well, you have already missed, in reality, uh, uh, a lot of uh, communications that have created that fertile ground. So of course it's not the same when we talk about this information which has a uh, ethnical connotation or anti-ethnical rather connotations or anti-religious connotation, you have a, 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 in front of you a range of content that you cannot qualify it as a hate crime uh, because that's not the characteristic of it, but still creates the conditions for hate crime to be committed afterwards. So in that sense, you're right, Marco, when you say the, the phenomenon we are trying to uh, describe and perhaps in the near future to regulate, it is wider. Uh, uh, at the same time, you see the responses need to be very much calibrated in order to remain proportionate to the nature of the uh, communication that needs to be addressed. In that sense, you know, you have uh, 
clear remedies like takedowns, notice and takedowns with certain uh, deadlines that may vary, by the way, according to national legislation. Uh, the, the German law imposed very draconian uh, uh, time limits uh, and, uh, um, and uh, strict sanctions uh, uh, when the time limits are not respected when it comes to, uh, to hate speech. Uh, but a, uh, that would not be appropriate, of course, uh, for uh, these information uh, campaigns around the same topics. For that, we need to have system in place, it's rule in place, that ensure really the uh, uh, a correct balancing on the distribution of content online, and therefore all the, all the issues around algorithmic decision making and uh, about uh, the uh, integrity of the services uh, uh, designed to avoid astroturfing or other dynamics from happening, and to give the citizens basically the possibility to have privileged access through due prominence uh, obligations on platforms regarding trustworthiness and uh, reliable content. But there are two different uh, approaches. One is takedowns, the other one is about demotion of content uh, and recalibrating the system for giving prominence to trustworthiness content. It's not it's exactly the same, but it's a continuum. One should see it as a continuum. I don't know whether that replies to your question, Michael. Thank you very much. Very, very helpful. And especially for people like myself working on freedom of religion or belief. And exactly. I was thinking of you. <laughs> you, you mentioned you being in a Jewish forum. For us, this, this, is, this is so relevant. And at the same time, so far from what was still the mindset of, 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 of people like myself would be specialists in that domain because we, you know, we, we really, uh, uh, as a community, still very far from being acquainted with what is happening, um, as you described it. So, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any other intervention? Otherwise, uh, we I'm give... Sorry. sorry. Yes. May I ask a question to Professor Lutz Martinez? Yes. Hi, Lutz. Hola. Uh, I would like to know, as we have heard in your brilliant presentation, that uh, there are some remedies, uh, but uh, these remedies uh, are remedies for uh, data subjects, but these remedies are mostly provided by contract law, or for instance, uh, you have not mentioned by antitrust, by competition law. So, in your opinion, uh, don't you think that the remedial framework uh, uh, provided by data protection law is too weak? Uh, although we have this uh, huge legislation, the huge piece of uh, this big piece of legislation, the GDPR. So uh, I, I'm curious to know your your what do you think about this? Professor Velencoso, I think that you might be mute. Yes, she's on mute. <laughs> Sorry, I had the microphone off. Sorry, I didn't notice that. So, uh, can you can you listen to me now? Yes. Okay, so I was telling that, yes, on the one hand, it's contradictory. They tell us uh, that we it is so sacred, protected our data. And the second one, they say you can do businesses with that. You can get uh, services only by providing your data. So, uh, but uh, the, 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 even the European uh, legislator has said, okay, it is, it is, this is happening. We are going to provide a remedy at least in case the the digital content is not functioning well it's not uh, uh, it's not uh, conform to the contract and uh, so my point of view it, it, from from my point of view i would say it is possible to do that you can do that but you have to be informed it, it should be respected transparency what exactly going to what going to happen with your data and it should be done in simple terms uh, that everyone we could understood about that uh, 
uh, not very complicated policy terms and that nobody, nobody understands, but also with some limits. So we have to make a, a balance between what, what, is, uh, what, is what you are providing and what, what you are receiving, because it, it depends uh, at case by case uh, easement. But even there, I have read that there's some, there are some scholars that they say in case even you are providing your data in an unlawful way, you should receive a remedy because otherwise, so it, it, saying that the contract is null and void because of this kind of non-respecting the norms of the, the, the data protection law, it, it could be worse for the consumer because the contract would be void and null, they, 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 the data would be all around there and they wouldn't receive a service, a, a remedy for the, for the non-fulfillment of the contract. So it is the, the, the point of view of, of some scholars. So I would say that you could do business, but uh, you have to be informed and with some limits, depending on the case. You would, for what purposes you are transferring your data. Okay, thank you. Uh, May I add perhaps some elements uh, to that question? Yes. Uh, yeah, because it refer uh, to the competition aspects. And that is a quite interesting point uh, in terms of structures uh, and uh, future uh, outlooks. Uh, the, uh, there is indeed a reflection about how uh, data markets have been defined so far and how should be defined. Uh, there is a whole reflection around the role of platforms at, uh, as uh, gatekeepers when they have a systemic uh, function in the market. So I think there is a lot of work still to be done there when it comes to protecting competition on tipping markets and when it comes to uh, remedies such as portability of personal data from one social to another social media platforms. Yeah, that's absolutely key, I think. And we have seen also intervention from, for instance, the Italian, the Italian Antitrust Authority, if I'm not wrong, has uh, recently published a report on that. And uh, we will hear something more uh, probably from the next presentation on this, on the interaction between uh, data protection and antitrust. So uh, I would say that we reconvene in uh, 14 minutes at 11 to start uh, the second session of today. And I thank you, the speaker, for being on time, giving relevant, interesting presentation and addressing the relevant question. Thank you, and we'll resume soon. Thank you. <laughs>